So the recreation sites element Stacy and I will discuss today is one of the 20 elements within the performance measure wilderness stewardship performance. So the recreation, recreation sites element is rooted within the undeveloped quality of wilderness character. This element is an optional element for all wilderness areas. However, as Chris noted, 340 of 448 wilderness areas are actually tracking this element, which does make it a very popular element. However, that makes sense. Uh, some of the very early monitoring protocols that came out in the 1970s as the Aldo Leopold Wilderness Research Institute was being created and developed was tied to recreation sites. Uh, that is where we started seeing some of the early monitoring protocols and identification of needs for monitoring. So a lot of areas have been collecting recreation site information for a long time. Um, and it's also something wilderness managers have struggled with for a long time. Um, I think I mentioned on Monday or yesterday uh, when somebody asked about recreation site monitoring, solitude monitoring, you know, I could think of my first years as a wilderness ranger before technology was very good. Um, and they were pretty much just hand drawn copied maps with little dots on it uh, to help you identify where past site monitoring occurred. Um, but we did do, uh, do some basic data, data gathering at those locations. Uh, but things have definitely improved as far as technology over the years compared to original site monitoring. But we've been uh, conducting recreation site monitoring for quite some time. So the intent of tracking this element is to accurately document the increases and decreases in the number of recreation sites, detect change in condition to the recreation sites, determine compliance with the forest plan, wilderness plan, or other planning documents that you may have in place. The other thing that we are doing when we are looking at these is to provide information about solitude as we, uh, in regards to sites and sounds uh, in proximity to that recreation site. This has been an element actually within the wilderness performance measure since 2001. And like I mentioned uh, yesterday, the wilderness performance measure has been in place since 2001. This was an original element, uh, but went through an update in 2015 which, uh, which is what we are discussing today, but it is one of the original wilderness elements. So this is a screenshot directly from the Wilderness Stewardship Performance Guidebook for this performance measure. The guidebook describes each of the elements in great detail for the recreation sites element. The guidebook provides a quick description expected outcome, and some of the key terms that you need to know when working with this element. So I'm going to go over a few of the key terms right now because you are going to need to know them as we go through our discussion today. So National Site Monitoring Protocol, there is a nationally developed minimum protocol that does include a census of sites in all likely locations, the collection of site coordinates, a condition class rating, and recording the number of administrative developments within that site. I think Stacy's going to cover that a little bit more in detail uh, when she uh, discusses uh, with some of the information she's going to provide. We also discuss uh, the recreation site monitoring plan throughout this presentation today, and I know Stacy's going to cover that one. So the recreation site monitoring plan is a plan that develops a wilderness-wide strategy for completing an inventory of recreation sites, including documentation of areas, and also it addresses what data is being collected and how it's going to be used and how to analyze that data. And as you heard from Dr. Marion's presentation, that's important to be able to uh, have that information identified. Um, and I, again, we're going to mention as well, staff changes. Um, there's been a lot of rotation and actually having all this documented for one person to pick up to then have another person pick up and understand the process is a very important step. And lastly, we're going to talk about, obviously, recreation sites. So a recreation site is defined as a site demonstrating observable impacts from repeated visitation, including campsites, day use sites, other recreation destinations, and some climbing areas. So let's talk about the element details. This is going to do a, a real just quick overview before we start going into each of the specific items. If you missed the WSP overview discussion yesterday, each element within Wilderness Stewardship Performance has five deliverables. 
and each deliverable has a level of points earned for achieving that deliverable. This shows the five deliverables associated with the recreation site element, which as you see, because of the sequential order, they must be completed in that sequential order as well. So the first is to develop a recreation site plan, conduct some monitoring is the second level, conduct some more monitoring is the third level, uh, looking at your management direction to see if it exists in either your forest plan or other documents to help you manage those recreation sites. And finally, that actions are taken when recreation, recreation site conditions are outside of those allowable conditions. So I'm going to turn it over to Stacy now for discussing some specifics on the monitoring plan. Great, thank you, Eric. And if you wouldn't mind clicking one more time to highlight the two point, there we go, beautiful, thank you. So as Eric mentioned, I'm going to cover the two point level of scoring and then he'll pick back up for the four, six and eight and then I'll join back in for the 10 point. Um, thanks again, everyone for uh, having me join today. And um, so as Eric stated, the first step within the recreation sites element is of course developing a recreation site monitoring plan. Again, this plan is to develop a wilderness-wide strategy for completing an inventory of recreation sites, including documentation of areas without established sites or areas where sites show only very slight evidence of use. The plan addresses why the data are being collected and how they will be used along with the data analysis protocol. So again, kind of the highlights of the plan is one, to include an inventory of all sites within your wilderness area. Also to have what data are being collected and how it will be used. And then of course, to include the data analysis protocol. Next slide, please. Okay, so making a plan. The good news for everyone is if you have not developed a plan yet, it really isn't as complicated as some plans tend to be. Um, there's lots of flexibility in how you want to formulate your plan. And the idea is to allow that flexibility so that needs are met based on each individual wilderness area. Basically, as long as you are following the national protocol, the plan components can be manipulated to meet the need of your wilderness area. On this slide are some example categories mixed in with the required information for the plan. Um, and I already kind of covered the required element or the required components on the previous slide. But in general, it's good to have a brief introduction about your wilderness area in your plan, a nice cover page, of course. Um, followed by a section on preparation for monitoring, what tools are needed, and then setting the stage for what you intend on monitoring. Bearing in mind, you must meet the minimum protocol, which we'll get more into in the coming slides. Of course, you want information on where you'll be monitoring, including all likely sites, but also you want to include lower impacted sites. Uh, oftentimes, impacts can be uh, better seen or identified if you're monitoring those lower impacted sites over time. So that's important to keep that in mind. It's also required that you do the monitoring on a five-year cycle and more information on that to come. And lastly, the section on the why of data collection is useful to have and will only substantiate your need for taking action or no action on your rec sites, depending on condition. Next slide, please. Here is more info on the minimum protocol for monitoring. You can actually see a screenshot there on the slide of that document. And um, I'll let you know here in just a minute where you can find it. And the minimum protocol means just that. It is the minimum. And in fact, it is strongly recommended that it is supplemented with additional data that are both more comprehensive and more precise dependent on your wilderness area. This minimum protocol does not provide information sufficient to be used to assess change over time on an individual site. So again, it's important to add data to what is within this minimum protocol. It does not also allow 
for significant types of impacts to be documented occurring on recreation sites outside of the protocol. So again, if you have significant impacts that you're seeing that aren't included, it's very important to expand on this protocol. Examples may include social trails, trash, number of fire pits within a rec site, evidence of stock use, number of visible campsites from the site, and many more depending on your wilderness area. Next slide, please. Okay, and then pulled directly from the minimum protocol, some additional information here. Um, it highlights the standards for credit. Please note that for full credit, all likely locations in the entire wilderness must be visited, not just locations in a portion of the wilderness. It really needs to be an all-inclusive um, study of all your rec sites. Partial credit can, however, be received, and info on that is also in the protocol. And probably goes without saying, but all rec sites must be monitored, as I've already mentioned, not just a portion. We need to include all of our sites. Again, data cannot be older than five years. And um, just a little more information on that, you may opt to collect all of your data within one year, or you may opt to spread it out over a five-year span of time, collecting 20% of data each year until you're complete, and then starting over um, every five years. And again, data collection must include location, site condition, and number of administrative structures within the site. Next slide, please. Okay, and of course, as I mentioned, um, if you need help getting started on your rec site monitoring plan, it is strongly encouraged you take a look at pre-existing plans and not completely reinvent the wheel for your plan. There's lots of good examples out there that can be located within the recreation site monitoring toolbox through Wilderness Connect as well as the Forest Service's internal SharePoint site for wilderness stewardship performance. Lastly, I do wanna mention when developing any plan for WSP elements, it's important to have line officer support and it's strongly encouraged, it's reviewed, approved, and even signed off on by the line officer. And then of course you would want to store it in a shared location such as Pinion, um, so that other wilderness folks can access it. And as Eric mentioned, with turnover rate and new employees, um, having this in a, a centrally located area is advantageous to everyone moving forward. Um, that's it, Eric, I'll turn it back over to you for the next few slides. Hey, Stacy, we do have a question in there that I'll throw back to you. And the question is, how is likely defined? Likely as, as far as where you would likely determine where sites are at? I actually get into that in the four and six point level. Okay, good. So, so we'll just stand be... by for Eric to, to cover it. And if the, if the answer still exists or it needs to be expounded on, we can do that afterwards. And I also noticed that Chris shook his head very up, up and down when you were talking about getting line ops support. So... <laughs> Good to note yeah. that the staff officer was agreeing with that. <laughs> so I'm going to discuss the four and six point levels together because they're awfully similar. Uh, so for the four point level, it states that you need to do an inventory for a substantial portion of your wilderness. The Wilderness Stewardship Performance Guidebook defines a substantial portion to be greater than 50% of the wilderness where campsites are likely to be found. So as you see right here, it even talks about sites being likely to be found. We're going to define that uh, in here in just a second. So I also want to note, this is not conducting a survey, survey in 50% of your entire wilderness, but again, that where sites are likely to be found, and we will define that just a little bit more here pretty quickly. So this is why the four and six point uh, I, I, the levels are being discussed at the same time. So at the four point level, it's 50%, at least 50% of the wilderness where sites are likely to be found. And for the six point level, it's all likely locations. So again, it's not all of your wilderness, but all likely locations. So there's a lot of similarity between the four point level and the six point level. And so that's why at the very beginning, when I said, you know, at the four point level, you're gonna be doing some monitoring and at the six point level, some more monitoring. So that kind of explains that a little bit. There is some more differences, 
with that six point level, but we're going to discuss that here in just a second. So what is a likely location and how do you figure it out? So in many cases, recreation site monitoring has been occurring in your wilderness for some time. So identifying likely locations probably has already taken place. And maybe some of the things you need to do is just validate whether that has, a, you know, validate that information. Um, like I said, you know, some of the wilderness areas that I monitored, we've been monitoring some of those areas since the 1970s. People were looking at these areas every five years. There was a, probably a good uh, uh, opportunity that the spots where recreation sites are going to be have probably been found. So the older your monitoring has been and the more complete it is on a regular basis, the chances are that the likely locations have already been identified for you. But let me tell you, technology has actually improved our ability to look at a wilderness and make those sound management decisions. One way you can find likely locations is to get with your GIS staff and run an analysis of your wilderness based on some basic factors. Overlay your trail system. People tend not, not to camp too far away from trails. Overlay water, especially lakes. Water is an attractor. Now take a look at your topography or your slopes. You can rule out a lot of locations that would be too steep for campsites. And when you combine all three of these layers, you can get a quick start for at least places that you would consider likely. Um, and shockingly, you actually may have some of this information available to you. Just connect with your heritage staff. Some forests, not all, but some forests have created predictive models or sensitivity models, either formally documented or just standard practice that guide where to focus heritage survey efforts. Slope models are common for national forests with topography, but so is proximity to water features, relatively level, well-drained soils, remnant roads, transportation routes, et cetera. So there is a lot of other information out there from your heritage staff that may be useful to you. This is also good to connect with your heritage staff on recreation site survey work anyway. Over the years, I can name up a situation here or there in which a well-intentioned wilderness ranger accidentally rehabilitated a site that they thought was a user created site, which actually ended up being an, uh, of historical significance. So there's some uh, really good information out there through your heritage staff, through GIS efforts, where you can start to identify what some of these likely locations may or may not be. If you have a recreation site monitoring program that, like I said, has been in place for some time, you can still go through this GIS process or connecting with your heritage staff just to validate what some of your mapping is already starting to show and what some of these this new mapping may identify as new places for you to look. Uh, I do want to mention there's a lot of flexibility will, built within wilderness stewardship performance, including the recreation sites element that allows for some local interpretation for applying the intent to match your local situation. We do look for irregularities in annual scoring, but we are not out there really just to call you up and say, hey, I see you scored a four. You need to justify that to me. That's not what wilderness stewardship performance is about. It's really about to give you some guides to monitor your wilderness, how you see best fit to monitor, uh, to, to monitor your wilderness. So ultimately what you decide is a substantial portion or what you feel are locations where sites are likely to be found ends up being your decision based on your local knowledge of your area. So uh, Chris, before I move on, I'm gonna see if that answered at least that question of likely locations. It did, Eric responded. That was helpful, thanks, Eric. All right. So let's go back to the four and six point level slide uh, and, and take a, a little bit more of a description of the recreation site inventory process. So a quick recap, since we walked away from this slide for a, a little bit is the four point level greater than 50% of likely locations and the six point level, all likely locations. So three questions you may be asking yourself right now. If I'm already monitoring all likely locations, can I take credit for the four point level? 
So in a sense, um, you, you, you went straight from the two point level to the six point level. And we've talked about that wilderness stewardship performance, especially how this uh, element is built is uh, sequential. But if you are actually going to the higher level of work, you don't have to drop down to the four point level to then go back to the six point level. So if you are already exceeding the standard of that greater, uh, greater than 50% of likely locations, Yes, you can skip that four point level and go straight on to the six point work. So the other questions sometimes uh, people ask are, why would I only monitor 50% of the sites? And if I did, how do I pick which 50%? So staffing and capacity is always an issue. As well intentioned as managers are, you can't do it all and you and your supervisor have to set those priorities. Maybe completing 50% of all likely locations is all that can be done in order to complete the other critical paths. I do wanna mention that 64% of our wilderness areas utilize volunteers and partner organizations to help us with critical work. Recreation site monitoring, I think is a perfect example of work volunteers and partners can do for the Forest Service and can do well. If you have capacity issues, consider reaching out to your local volunteers or partners. So I did see in the last session, there was uh, some concern raised in one of the chats about the consistency with volunteers. So some of that I think is honestly dependent on the protocols and the RIC site monitoring plan that is in place. How detailed is your plan? How specific are you about your protocols? And, and that is really where I think it lays out how how easily you can hand off a plan and say, here's what, here's what we're doing, here's how it works, um, please go help us with this. Obviously with anything, training is required, uh, but it's the same thing as even Jeff Marion said, there can be inconsistency with seasonal workforce monitoring one year and then a different seasonal workforce monitoring five years later. If you don't have detailed protocols and detailed monitoring specifics in place. I think the same thing goes with a lot of our volunteer and partner organizations. Um, if we have the proper protocols in place ahead of time, they can do this work just as well as I think staff can, especially when we have those staffing uh, capacity issues. So if you can only monitor 50% of your sites, um, I think the thing that you need to do is start to focus on your high use areas locations where monitoring is or has shown accelerated impacts, location with user conflicts, or either other input provided by specialists, especially soils, wildlife, and aquatics. Hey, Eric, we've got a couple of questions in the chat box. Sure. So a little bit of throwback. Why would the heritage staff deal with rec sites and campsites outside of cultural sites? So what they're doing is actually doing an overall assessment of the forest to help them identify where heritage sites would be likely found. There's a lot of protocols, like I said, that the heritage program and, and Chris, I think you got heritage under your staff. So you can probably even add to this as well. But I know, so like I think it's the Wayne National Forest. They do mapping protocols uh, with slopes, uh, anything greater than 15% uh, they don't consider uh, uh, appropriate for heritage sites. And a lot of the heritage sites are where the, uh, uh, whether it be uh, Native Americans um, or early settlers camped. Um, so you will see a lot of the camping kind of things that people look for for camping sites is the same kind of things that people look for um, um, as far as what heritage sites are looking for for early settlers. So slope, water, access routes, those are key features. Um, that people would be looking for um, when they were coming into, or into these areas. And they're the same features that people are looking for now as recreationists. And one more. So a question about low level of use in the wilderness. Uh, we have several wildernesses without trails and low level use. Would you recommend doing a similar GIS analysis? So the, then the bigger question is, is recreation sites identified as one of the elements for those wilderness areas? A lot of times the wilderness areas that don't have trails, I haven't seen recreation sites also identified as a selected element. So, um, I, you know, like I said, 340 out of 448 uh, areas have selected uh, recreation sites. And that's just because it's an issue. Low level wilderness or low use wilderness areas and 
um, uh, trailless wilderness areas may not have identified that just because it may not be as much of a priority. However, um, I'm going to get to something important related to that here in just a minute. So um, any other questions, Chris? No, that's it, sir. All right. So the last item that the four point level and the six point level have in common is, as Stacy mentioned, monitoring every five years. Um, so Stacy talked in detail about the, the monitoring plan being specific to a five year cycle and that what that is should be detailed in the plan. As she noted, is that 20% of the sites every year? Is that doing them all at one time? And I think that's just all dependent again on your capacity and the number of sites within your wilderness. Some of the smaller wilderness areas, it may be easier just to do 100% of your sites in one year and not worry about it for another five years. Some wilderness areas, uh, just because of their sheer size and number of sites, you have to break it up. Um, or that's all you're going to be doing all summer long. So 20% of the sites is, is, is important there. So why was the five-year cycle selected? So again, we talked about recreation site research goes back a long time, um, at least compared to, comparatively to other wilderness research. And it consistently has shown that ground cover loss soil exposure can happen very, very quickly in recreation areas, even with modest use. And while we, and if we have extensive use, that disturbance can be extremely quick. So by having things on a five-year cycle, we can catch those negative impacts in time to take management actions. So finally, uh, the six-point level has just a few more tasks. First, the data must be entered into an electronic format, again, uh, this is what, you know, whatever meets your needs. Uh, our focus here is that the information just isn't sitting in a shoebox somewhere or in a file box in a basement of an office that gets tossed out during the next office cleanup day. So data entry into some kind of a system is a, a very important step. So for those of you that know Natural Resource Manager or NRM, which is the agency corporate database, um, this is an option. There is a, a uh, application in there for recreation site monitoring uh, data entry. If I was you, I wouldn't use it. Um, it was built around 2005 and has a lot of uh, limitations specifically. It does not have a spatial component and Jeff Marion even talked about the need for spatial information. So this is at your disposal. Um, I'm not going to talk about it much longer than this because I think you can develop something a lot better at the local level to meet your needs much, much better. So one example, and I know Jeff talked about these as well, data collectors. Uh, here's an example from the Gifford Pinchot National Forest in 2019 using an S1 mobile mapper software on GPS enabled tablets and phones. Again, Jeff mentioned that. And then the data is managed in RTS online and later exported to the Forest Service server. I highly encourage you to use the technology that is available to you. It's out there. It works really, really well. Okay, so let's move on to the eight point level. So I'm going to ask David to put up the next poll question. So what we're going to talk about here is the forest plan and management direction. So what I'm just trying to figure out, do you, do you know if your forest plan has information related to rec site sites? Does it not? Have you never looked? Do you even have a clue what the forest plan is? All right, we're getting a good amount of responses. Kind of excited to see if that, uh, that many yeses, believe it or not. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and shut down the poll. So actually a fair amount of people have never looked. Um, so that's really good information to know from my part, um, but also yours um, gives you an opportunity to look at your forest plan and see if there's anything there that might help you. So this component of the element reads that direction exists in the management of wilderness recreation sites, either in the forest plan, wilderness management plan, or locally developed advisory documents. The important part of this is it's not that just direction exists, 
but the direction is specific enough for you to take action when certain thresholds are surpassed. So what are the different documents and which one has more authority? So the forest plan, each national forest has a forest plan that is required to be updated every 10 to 15 years or so. This is the first place you need to look. Um, and like I said, it looks like a fair many people have not looked in the forest plan, but this is where it's a good place to look for direction related to recreation sites in your wilderness. The forest plan standards and guidelines that direct the National Forest of Management also include the direction for wilderness management. However, if you I'm not be surprised if you don't find anything, but uh, we'll we'll see see what happens if you take a look at your rec, uh, forest plan. So some wilderness areas have management plans, uh, which is not the forest plan; it's a specific wilderness plan. Many of these were developed in the 1990s, but they have not been a big emphasis really in the last 20 years. Some forest plans have incorporated those wilderness plans, however. So if you have a wilderness management plan, look through it. There may be some good information related to recreation sites. Uh, I helped with the development of the Bridger Wilderness Plan in 1994. Um, and it has seven pages of very detailed information to protocols, acceptable condition classes, actions to take when sites are exceed acceptable levels, what acceptable levels even means. And even in 1995, it discussed the need to look at more quantitative and detailed monitoring systems in the future. Lastly, local developed advisory documents. These can be a variety of things, but I'm gonna focus on two items, the recreation site monitoring plan that Stacy talked about at the beginning and monitoring reports. These documents don't hold the force or authority as a forest plan, but if you feel your forest plan does not have adequate language related to recreation sites, adding new language to the forest plan is probably not gonna happen relatively quickly. Like I said, their forest plans are only revised every 10 to 15 years or so. And so getting that information in a forest plan may not happen right away. So looking at something else is a good way to go. So the Gifford Pinchot National Forest Rec Site Monitoring Report in 2019 noted that they used the National Monitoring Protocol. And it also went on to say that they felt that the protocol was a quick inventory tool and that they needed to add supplementary information. But lastly, their report noted that when the forest plan goes through its next revision, that detailed protocol for recreation site monitoring needed to be added to the forest plan. So again, I said earlier, I'm, we are not going to hunt you down and find out what document you're using to help you with recreation site direct in direction. What we're looking for is something that is in place to allow a consistent approach for recreation site management it provides rationale for the protocols you're using and is detailed enough to identify things like what level of impact is acceptable, uh, what the what management action to take if it's not, um, number of sites, you know, just those types of things. It needs to be detailed. Last thing I'm going to mention before we look at some examples is that uh, the National Visitor Use Monitoring data from 2020 suggesting that there was a 75% increase in wilderness visitation last year. With that increased visitation, uh, we saw new recreation sites being created, sites being expanded, trees cut for firewood, development of Flintstone furniture, and that type of thing. So it's important that you have quality recreation site data and quality direction in place to help guide you, even if recreation sites is not an issue with you right now. With a 75% increase in wilderness use, we need to know our current conditions so we can be prepared and proactive in our management approaches and not reactive, especially as we discussed earlier, impacts of soil and vegetation can happen pretty quickly. So I'm gonna run through a few uh, slides really quickly on site uh, 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 management direction. So I, I leave enough time for Stacy to finish off. So this is really bad direction. Um, and this is something you're going to find probably in a handful of your forest plans, nothing. Um, and so it is important uh, for you to look and see what is in your plan, see what's there and you know, where else can you put things and make recommendations for the future. Here's some information um, that is in forest plans. I pulled all this directly from forest plans. This is in a forest plan, but I don't know if it's providing much help. Monitor wilderness recreation sites. Great. Take management action when conditions at recreation sites are unacceptable. 
just there's no details here. Campsites with user created fire rings are present um, and concentrate on proving conditions at campsites. Here's some better examples that user built campsites will be monitored on a rotation basis every five years using protocols, detailed enforced recreation site monitoring plans. If through monitoring impacts exceed allowable limits, sites will be rehabilitated. Currently there are three indicators that are considered, et cetera, et cetera. So I just really wanna focus on just the details that a really good forest plan or other direction can have. Again, campsites are managed to maintain a Frizzell condition class three or better. Campsites with a four or five will be rehabilitated. One user created firing will be allowed for each campsite. Hitch areas may have some bare ground, but the trunks or trees are not scarred. Uh, again, just a little bit more information, but just very detailed on the sites, what's allowable, what's acceptable, what to do if not. And one of my favorites is actually one forest plan that refers you to the recreation site monitoring plan, which allows there probably be more flexibility because it's much easier to update a recreation site monitoring plan than that forest plan. So deferring to something else, but giving it that authority in the forest plan is very useful. All right, Stacy. Okay, um, click the slide again to highlight the 10 points, please. There we go. Okay, so we're on to the 10 points for, uh, for this element. And basically you have two options within this 10 point score. Um, if conditions are within desired condition, again, like Eric mentioned, based on a management plan, then no further actions are needed at that time until you um, do further monitoring down the road and, and determine that the conditions have changed to be undesirable. Um, and then of course, the second option, if monitoring shows that the current conditions are not compliant with the desired conditions, then appropriate actions have to be taken. Um, actions can range significantly. And again, it can depend on your specific wilderness area and needs. Um, I am going to provide a snapshot on the next slide, highlighting some of the more common management actions. And then I'll take you through just a couple of examples of wilderness areas that have been implementing some management actions. Um, Again, I want to emphasize any management actions that are determined as needed need to be vetted with line officers and approved before doing so. Um, very important to get forest leadership on board for anything you're proposing to do in the wilderness. Next slide, please. Okay, so examples of taking action may include a more concentrated effort around educational messaging or possibly a permit system to put parameters around use, depending on um, the type of use and the issues that you're seeing. Other options may include permanent structures where use is high and impacts are evident, such as uh, fire rings, latrines, and so on. Or perhaps a closure order is more effective for your area. A lot of times it's determined that, you know, to get things under control, you've just got to implement a closure order for a particular area. Fees could also be implemented to slow the use. So that's something to consider. And the list goes on and on. And a good point of reference for this is the Recreation Impacts in Management and Wilderness, a state of knowledge review um, shown on this slide. And I'm sure we can get that out to folks if they don't have that accessible. Uh, next slide, please for my first example of taking action. So I'm sure most of us are familiar with the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Um, this is a screenshot of their uh, website for the forest. And you can see that um, they take it very seriously because like Eric said, where there, are, where there is water, there's likely rec sites and campsites because people are drawn to water. So needless to say, Boundary Waters is an attractive area because of the water. Um, the Boundary Waters implemented a permit system with an educational component requiring completion prior to issuing a camping permit. So this is kind of interesting and um, from my understanding it's been very successful. But the idea is that permit holders must attend one education, education session to receive their permit. This is a 20 minute session. Um, and prior to COVID, it was in person, but now this is also offered virtually. 
Um, and the session includes information on Leave No Trace, rules and regulations for the area, and latest forest alerts. Um, so again, it's kind of putting all of that information right in the face of the user before they head out um, to utilize the backcountry for camping. Additionally, the Boundary Waters has designated campsites with fire grates and latrines to try to concentrate that use and, and minimize the overall impact. So a very good example of some uh, out of, outside the box ideas for taking action. Next slide, please. Also worth highlighting is actually my home unit um, on the Hoosier National Forest. This is where the Charles C. Dean Wilderness is located, the only designated wilderness in the state. Um, gets a lot of use. Again, the most popular areas access a large recreation lake. So again, people drawn to that water source. Um, the DEEM has designated campsites, but no permanent structures such as fire rings or latrines at this time. Additional educational efforts have been made by incorporating in the Leave No Trace Traveling Trainer Hotspot Program, um, which they have now visited the DEEM twice, once in 2014 for the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act, and then again for a follow-up visit in 2019. From these visits, a public engagement strategy was developed to supplement the education plan for the DEEM um, and to better hone in on some of the specific issues we're dealing with, particularly at an area um, that I was mentioning that is near a water source. Other actions include adding small leave no trace campsite signage. Um, I think maybe I showed that on a slide. If not, maybe it's coming up still, but um, we've incorporated in some campsite signage, very small, but um, highlighting some of those most important principles of Leave No Trace, um, dealing with some of the issues that we deal with. Um, increasing portal signage and other materials to visitors has also been part of this effort. And to better explain what this Leave No Trace hotspot program is, I do have two short videos to share that the Leave No Trace traveling trainers developed for us. Um, the first one is a short awareness video on how to properly uh, collect firewood and build a campfire in a wilderness. And then the second video will uh, demonstrate uh, to music <laughs> and in uh, high speed how to dismantle and rehab an overused fire pit. And we have used both of these videos for public engagement. Uh, to better address and to just better illustrate to our public what we're dealing with at some of our rec sites. So David, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and sharing that first video. We're the Subaru Leave No Trace Traveling Trainers, here working with the Hoosier National Forest about how we can educate visitors to lessen their impact on the Charles C. Deem Wilderness. Here on the Deem Wilderness, we want to have responsible campfires. That means following the four Ds of firewood collection. We want wood that's dead, down, dinky, about wrist size or smaller, and we want to collect our wood from a distance. We also want to make sure that we leave what we find. Moving rocks can disturb wildlife habitat and speed up soil erosion. It's also very important to concentrate our camping impacts to designated sites. And don't forget to leave no trace and enjoy your world. I'm seeing the comment, wow, story of my life. Yeah, boy, I bet most of us can relate to that. Um, again, uh, thanks for sharing that. Uh, hopefully that wasn't real loud on your guys' end. It was pretty loud on my end, but at least the music was entertaining. Um, just to recap quickly, and then we'll close out. Um, again, make sure line officers are on board for all of this. Um, you've got to have support from people above you. And of course, you can always reach out to um, your WEPS representatives, Eric, and other folks that are 
a little more knowledgeable on some of this than folks that are just getting started with um, rec sites. And um, I think that's it. I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation.